Welcome to our second annual Pitch Tank competition happening live on the Grace stage, um, presented by DXV Canada and The Mine. Um, I'm Jamie Gillen. I'm the editorial director of Gray. We're really happy to be bringing this program here uh, second year. Um, as last year, uh, the editors combed through the online submissions that we received, and we narrowed it down to the five pitches that we found most compelling, and we think you will too. Um, the pitches range from a series of compact modular furniture to a smart and indoor garden, to prefabricated concrete panels, to zip-on, zip-off lampshades, to high-tech trash bins. Um, and if you've watched Shark Tank or Dragon's Den, you'll get the gist. But the way this works is um, each of the pitchers has two minutes to pitch their prototype or their concept. Um, and at that point, our esteemed panel of judges is going to ask a bunch of questions to kind of help us understand a little bit more about um, this idea and how thought through it is, is it scalable, um, et cetera. And then we'll move on to the next. Um, and the, the pitchers, I want to kind of specify, we are on a tight time timeline. We're saying that they have two minutes to make their pitch. And at the 30 second mark, when you have 30 seconds left, Abby over here is going to hold up a yellow card. And you guys have to be watching for that. And then at two minutes, red card, got to stop, even if you have more to say. Um, uh, so the winner, um, decided by the judges behind the scenes afterward, will um, receive off-site mentorship by the judges, sort of to help them develop their business concept. Um, and they'll also be published in the next issue of Gray Magazine. And then meanwhile, while the judges are talking and deliberating, you guys have ballots, hopefully you saw on your seat, um, and as well as pencils, you'll mark your sort of audience favorite, who you would like to see win. And then that um, uh, audience favorite will receive a $200 gift certificate to the mine. And the judges winner and audience winner can be uh, the same pitch or it can be different. We'll just have to see how things unfold. Um, and I'd like to start by introducing our judges. Thank you guys for being here. Um, Tessa, right here. Tessa Andrews is the co-owner of Pax and Fay, a communications firm based in Seattle, specializing in public relations for companies in the design industry. And full disclosure, that also includes Gray. Um, prior to owning her company, Tessa worked as the marketing manager at, a, at sustainable materials manufacturer Three Form, and then she lived in South Africa where she collaborated with a group of artisan entrepreneurs developing their business plan in exchange for training in their local crafts. Okay. Um, Zach, back here in the hat. Uh, his career spans the conventional and the unconventional with a background in both corporate finance as well as art and design. After spending time in Denmark and New York, he now leads the Pacific Northwest contract market for design within reach. Um, he describes his interest in design as focusing on equality, creative, creativity, and collaboration. Um, Leanna Hawkins, right here, is an entrepreneur, author, investor, and the president of Black Hawk Financial. She has over 12 years of experience working alongside uh, multiple financial services, alter alternative investment, technology, and design companies worldwide. Her first book, Young, Fun, and Financially Free, is launching this November, and it's a Money 101 playbook for anyone just starting to take control of their financial life. Um, and her company provides employee financial wellness programs and one-on-one -on -one client coach coaching, and she's actually offered um, to donate one of her valuable financial literacy workshops to the Pitch Tank winner and any staff that they may have. So thank you for that. And Tyson, who just made a dramatic entrance, <laughs> Uh, he's co-founder and partner of experiential branding and events agency, The Social Concierge. They design brand experiences for clients such as Nike, Porsche, Lululemon, and Veuve Clicquot. The agency also creates and owns their own signature series of events, including Dinner by Design, um, which is happening uh, this year, November 16th. And of that, um, Tyson is both curator and producer. OK, so you guys have a lot of interesting perspective to bring to the conversation. And so we'll look to you to kind of um, narrow, drill down on, on these pitches. So I'll turn the stage over to our first pitcher. Um, welcome. We'll, we'll hear from, um, I think it's Chase Ando uh, with Ava Byte. Okay, and there's your mic. Oh, you have a is lav. This, is this one? Is this one working? Test, test. Ma, are we using a handheld or the lav on this one? Handheld. Handheld. Hello, test, test. Okay, perfect. Now, 
Raise your hand if you've ever killed a plant. Don't worry, I'm not judging. It, it's hard, I get it. It's hard because it takes a lot of space, time, and effort to be able to grow anything. And what's happening in the world of food, which is really interesting, is that we're starting to see growing trends in organic, locally sourced, and sustainable foods. And these trends are here to stay as more people are really into what put, they put into their bodies and how it really works. So imagine a world where everyone has access to the freshest ingredients grown at their fingertips all year round. Now, meet Ava Byte. Byte is a smart indoor garden that essentially enables anyone, anywhere to be able to grow one day anything. It works like an espresso machine where we use compostable and biodegradable plant pods that house everything that a plant needs to thrive. So all it, you have to do is pick what you want to grow, put it in the device, and watch it grow. Now, in the last two months, we've been able to sell $120,000 worth of gardens in 45 different countries and have big retailers like Amazon, Target Open House, and Beta all interested in grabbing a bite. Now, just a little bit about myself. I grew up cooking in different restaurants and found that every chef wants access to the freshest ingredients possible. And so they want to source and serve the freshest and the best. Now, in order for them to be able to do that, they can't be sourcing their ingredients from all over the world, coming in plastic herbs, fresh herbs and greens, coming in plastic bags, uh, only to die off in three to four days. So we put together a team of food scientists, designers, engineers, uh, and just awesome people in being able to bring Ava Byte to life. Now, what unifies us is one single vision, and that's to feed the world's transition to sustainable food. And we're trying to help you and start that journey by simply helping you grow. Thank you. Do you want to hold it in the middle? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yep. Yeah, there we go. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, this is really in an interesting concept. Um, how are you getting your message out right now? Seems like you've already done some good business. Yeah, so we actually just launched an Indiegogo campaign back in June, and we have an email list of about 14,000 people that we acquired through a lot of Facebook advertising, being at trade shows like this, talking to people face to face, and it, it really helps to get the word out, um, just being in front of people. Um, can I ask what the industry savings is for chefs and industrial use that you said that this could be um, put into? So does, will it actually save a company money? Um, yeah, it's, we're, we're not looking to have a restaurant's entire herb supply come through here, but uh, one of the issues Chase brought up is that the plants arrive dead. And with a solution like this, we're speaking to a restaurant currently about installing a few of these where the plants will be kept alive until they're used by the bartenders in this case. And uh, so I haven't done any calculations on the overall uh, exposure, but this is not a solution for everything that a restaurant needs. This is more... Uh, for the home consumer and as a piece of the decor and the atmosphere of a restaurant or business. Uh, does it come in other colors and sizes? Yeah. So it comes in a high gloss white, um, a matte black, and a metallic silver. And uh, this is the first model that we've launched. We're planning on going, so this is a byte. We're planning on scaling up to the megabyte and the gigabyte. So. I like that, by the way. Um, <laughs> what? So uh, obviously, can you explain a little bit of the, about the types of plants that are the, have been proven to be the most successful? Because uh, you know, I'm looking at that, and you know, those are really interesting plants. I know that there's an obvious market for like home fresh herb gardens and that type of thing. What types can you, of plants can you actually grow successfully in this? So what we found is uh, really good success rates with microgreens, so really densely packed uh, with nutrition uh, and really fast to grow. So those things grow within 10 days. It's, it's quite amazing. And uh, 
anything like your herbs that you would use for a steak when you're seeing, seeing a steak. So thyme, oregano, rosemary, uh, basil, of course. Um, and beyond that, we have small vegetables uh, and fruits. So we have tomatoes, uh, cherry tomatoes, strawberries, and uh, the ability to grow chili peppers. We're also experimenting with mushrooms, but uh, that one's to be determined. That one's a sort of tricky one. And you passed us earlier, uh, I don't know if everybody, if you held one up for everybody to see, uh, sort of like a microchip board. Uh, yeah. Can you explain a little bit more about the, the digital technology that is involved in this? Because totally, yeah. I'm operating under some sort of assumption that that's just not just a cool thing to look at. <laughs> right, yeah. So, so what we've been able to do is combine nature, what we know in nature, design, and technology, and merge it all into one product. So the, there's a Wi-Fi controller. So it's, it's basically a processor that learns how to better grow over time. There's a camera in there. There's sensors. So it's essentially the Tesla of gardens. Um, it goes beyond just look, looking pretty and sitting in your countertop. It actually helps to collect data about how to better grow things over time and optimizes. Uh, so it's a, a self-learning garden that you can learn with. Um, what types of things are you guys looking for in terms of support for your business? So are you looking to raise funds, or do you need network connections, or what do you need? All of the above. <laughs> and um, what would it be used for? Yeah, so right now we're trying to get into retailers. So as we mentioned, Amazon, Target, um, and uh, Beta. And these are all big uh, American chains. And our hope is to be able to expand beyond Canada and into the States um, and have great awareness there. So media, fundraising, we're looking for both of those. Um, are, do you guys have a lot of competition in this, in this realm right now? I would imagine so. Um, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to add on to the digital technologies. There are products similar to it in the market, but they have basically the same issue as soil-based gardening for users, where the user has to have, have to really pay attention to, is the soil wet or is the reservoir full? The reason we've gone digital is everyone here has a smartphone in their pocket, and now we can integrate into the device that you pick up 50 to 100 times a day. Um, so while there are on the surface competitors, it, I believe that we are truly offering the, the value proposition of all the companies and are going to be able to deliver it in a way that the competitors have not. And like we're fans of our competing companies, but it just hasn't, um, our experiences with those products hasn't lived up to the hype. And, Thank you, guys. That's, uh, that's been the five. Thanks so much. We'll transition yeah. to the next. Um, okay, I got, I got. Okay. Is this the one that's working? Okay. Uh, which one? The middle one or that one? That one. That one. Okay. And then we've got um, Randy Orr from Distinct Interiors presenting his concept for modular concrete panels. Testing, testing. Okay. Where's the clock? You the clock? Say when. Hi, my name is Randy Orr. I'm a decorative artist. I'm based right here in Vancouver, BC, and I've been working through the years on techniques of working with concrete. And today, I would like to actually talk about Matt. He's my concrete. He's a concrete overlay, and what I've done over the years is I've created this aesthetic for making the appearance of concrete on different forms. The cool thing about Matt is that he's ultra light ultra thin and adds no weight to the foundation of your home and I can apply them to virtually any surface. I had a client back in 2008 that asked me to convert their old brick fireplace into a nice modern aesthetic. So I coated it with matte to give it the urban vibe from Yale Town or whatever you see in magazines like in grey. So that idea has led on to so many ideas with concrete that I fell in love with it. And so I create different themes of concrete for my clients, which are architects, designers, home owners, just like yourselves. But the cool thing is it's non-combustible. It can go outside, it can go inside. I can put it on paper, I can put it on metal, I can put it on plastic, I can put it on virtually anything. If you come to our booth, you'll see our ceiling that's suspended in concrete, but it virtually has no weight. The whole idea of matte is to take it 
beyond Vancouver. Because of social media and doing shows like this where my business has grown, I need to get it out to different spots like New York, Toronto, LA. So I've come out with a board that is non-combustible, cuts laser sharp with a saw, and you can install it. Piece of cake to install, a little bit of glue, a little bit of nails, and then you're done. Beautifully handcrafted, bespoke concrete. That's my passion, and that's what I'm here to share with you and this panel. Thank you so much. So is this a product, an application, or a service? Yes, yes, and yes. I basically started out as a service-based business model, and I've been providing it throughout the Lower Mainland, Whistler to White Rock, Kelowna to Victoria. But being an artisan and being a little bit narcissistic about what I do, I have never stretched beyond myself. But because of the media attention you get now through social media and shows and whatnot, I have to think outside of my box. So I've now put it on a panel that is matte right here on a little panel. And you can see it's about a credit card in thickness. And that whole idea is you can install it virtually anywhere in your house. So do you sell it as a board or in a bucket? A board. It's a three feet by five foot board. And it weighs 40 pounds. And is there acoustical properties to that? So it you... has some insulation qualities to it, but you are creating a concrete aesthetic. So you will have some reverberation off it. So it's about the aesthetic as opposed to any other use? I'm about the aesthetic of concrete. It is strong, but you're not building a foundation with this. This is more for decor, obviously. So it's like a concrete paint. A concrete overlay is the term we use. Yeah. Um, so aside from uh, social media and shows like this, what are you doing to get this product into architecture and design offices right now? Well, I started in 2011 with a 5 by 10 booth here, and I love IDS because to me it's show and tell for adults. I come here, I get to show what I've done, and then you know, say where we're going with ideas. Then you get a designer that comes to you and says, do you think you can make it look like this? And I think, yeah, I can. Although I may not figure it out right away, but I'll get it there. So that's kind of the way it goes. So each year my booth has grown, and now I'm in a 10 by 20 here showing sort of the bigger virtues of what can be done. Um, are there any pr other products like this on the market, and do you have this patented, or have you applied for patents and coverage to make sure that you get to keep this technology as yours? Great question. Yes, it is patent pending, which thou is in place. The idea is concrete boards are out there, but you have to go to Home Depot, you have to go to different stores and buy it. Then you've got to find somebody like me to come in and make it look pretty. So what I've done is I've married the two together so that you can actually just buy the board with the finished aesthetic on it, and then just install it, as opposed to having to hire other trades, which just gets more complex and a bit more of a babysitting scenario as you get into the trade world. So people can in install it themselves? In essence, down the road, yes. But right now, I will certify my installers just so that we can have quality control. So you do have a way um, to scale out the business so that you could service North America with this product? Absolutely. Okay. And beyond North America, yes. From a brand perspective, um, are, have you spoken with any other major appliance partners or retailers or people that, you know, obviously, I mean, interior designers would be a great target audience for this, but ultimately, they will be the ones that would help you sell this in to their clients. I would imagine it's not di directly targeted towards a consumer. Is that, is that kind correct? of a bespoke craft model I'm going for where I, I don't think I want to go to retail because the margin is going to be cut by 50% right off the bat. And I've been in that model before with a different product. And when you get stretched financially, it's very difficult. But in this case, I make it. It's four to six weeks to order. And what you buy, you don't buy at Home Depot. It's custom. It's unique. And it's yours. Um, have you had any, any coverage in architecture design publications, more trade-oriented? I'm a decorative artist by trade, so I've been doing this for 25 years. The concrete itself, I did advertise in gray last year, which did help me get contacts from America, which was great, but I'm Canadian, so it's a bit difficult to go down there and do work. So then I thought, wait a second, if I can provide it to you on a board, I could send it to you. I had Starbucks in Chicago call me, and I said, well, I would love to do the wall for you, but I can't get there physically but now I can. 
what would be the price difference? And like you said, for example, you had a client who uh, resurfaced their fireplace. So uh, doing a regular concrete, heavy um, fireplace, uh, <laughs> I'm clearly the money person. I don't even know what you call it, resurfacing a fireplace versus doing it this way. You're, you're kind of giving a new skin to the surface, and it's a good question. The idea of working with concrete is it's very heavy, it's dusty, and it's difficult to work with. With mat, it's just a very thin overlay, so there's no structural needs to be done with it in that respect. Um, and the cost is starts at $20 a square foot for mat on the board. If I'm coming to the house and doing an installation for you, I start at $30 a square foot when I'm doing walls. So how much would that cost on a project, like a project straight comparison basis for someone to pour and make a... A concrete fireplace traditionally versus this? The clients I get are people that have condos or apartments or homes that are already built. So it's, I'm either spec and I come in and help them. But if you're actually going to pour a concrete foundation after your house has already been built, you, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Right? So we're kind of a solution to that model. OK, thank you so much. We'll move on to the next. Thank, thank you. you, Randy. I'm just going to take my bench with me. <laughs> oh, that's so, can we touch it? You know, and actually, Randy, do you mind keeping it there for the next picture? Is that, I don't know if that's <laughs> just out of the kindness of your heart. I know she needs something to put down. down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next, we have Laura Anderson with RD Shady. Okay, we're going to, um, Rachel, would you help her bring the stuff forward? Okay. Oh, here, you can come up the front over here. Do you need another hand? OK. And you, if you guys could put it just on the bench here. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> right up here. Hello. I'm Laura Anderson, and I am an interior designer in Olympia, Washington. And I'm here today to show you a product that I um, have patented, as well as a follow-up product that I have patented as well. Um, this invention, if you will, came out of a need in the marketplace that I saw with clients who had really dated lamps. And we've all seen them. Um, and what I find is that updating the lampshade um, is the easiest way to update a lamp and give it a whole new life. But finding lampshade replacements was very difficult. It was find, uh, hard to find sizes that would fit a large range of lamps. And of course, if you're wanting to do any patterns or um, fabrics, um, that could be very expensive to do custom. So out of that need, um, I designed RD Shady, and the RD is for Red Door, that is the name of my interior design business, and Shady is for lampshades. So I'm going to go ahead and just demo this for you. Oh, yeah, because I'll need to. OK. Um, so what you do is first you look at your existing lamp, and you decide which size that you think will fit your lampshade or fit your lamp best. Um, you pick out your starter kit, and that's a basic white um, linen lampshade that you see here. And it comes with the hardware to attach to your existing lamp. And then you have the fun part of picking out whatever fabric or pattern that works in your personal home. Take it out of its storage tube. You simply connect the zipper in the back. This can also be done in Velcro. There you are. OK. Sure. I'll show you just quick evolution. Um, one of the problems I found with lampshades was they're expensive to ship and they get damaged. That's my mom. <laughs> 
Oh, sure. This is the second generation, just so you can see, where it's a completely collapsible lampshade that doesn't require a fixed lampshade underneath. It's the, um, the wire that hooks onto the arty shady itself. Okay. Did the demand for this product come more um, from people wanting to do something creative in their home to customize their home, or because there's an actual need for replaceable lampshades or just new lampshades rather than a whole new lamp? I think both. Um, what I've seen in the marketplace and with your television shows that are on HGTV is there's this huge trend in um, American homes and specifically to change out decor seasonally. And uh, people want to put their personal touch. Um, and you, there's really no way you can do that with lampshades in a way that um, there was any uniqueness or uh, patterns available. Um, so yeah, I saw it kind of in, in, in both, both ways. Have, have you gotten the word out about this? And if so, kind of how, like, locally, nationally? Yes. Um, this has been a long process. I started the patent process in, in 2010. And I went into it thinking I was going to be the manufacturer and distributor. Um, I feel as if I've got my MBA through this process. And I, what I've learned is that licensing is really what I want to do with this product. And I feel that it will be most successful if it's in the hands of uh, people that build lamps, that sell lamps, lamp manufacturers, because they understand who the client, who the customer is. Um, so trying to license to different retailers and manufacturers is what I'm focusing on with the product now. Two quick questions for you. One, in that case, who's manufacturing it right now? And how customizable are the shades? On a small scale with customizable, my mom makes them. So she can customize for any designer that wants to send us a fabric. She can make you a shade cover on a small scale. Um, we do have a licensing agreement with Kenroy Home, and they're out of Jacksonville, Florida. And they have the ability to produce on a much larger scale. Um, and they have you know, gotten the cost of the manufacturing down to a, 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 an amazing low price that you could see being mass produced um, you know, for large retailers. Well, one of the reasons why I'm asking is because, obviously, as, as the business would grow in scale and the manufacturing, which you wouldn't control, would need to increase, in my mind, that would mean there would have to be, at some point, a decrease in the amount of customization that could come Absolutely. together. Absolutely. The customization may be here short term, um, just as something, because I, I love to do that. Um, but my big picture is to have this in every household across America. And to do that, I need to have the manufacturers um, doing the, the producing of the product and the distributing. How much does it cost? Well, for me personally, when I was um, on the custom level, let's say it costs roughly about $12 to make. Um, but in the pricing that we've done overseas, we're looking more at like a $4 price point to make it overseas. So um, having a selling price of around $20 for the covers. Have you sold any yet? I've sold thousands, actually, just me. Um, but then pretty much put the brakes on that last year when I started going down the licensing route. Were you just doing that online, or how are you? How yeah, I had a website, so RD Shady, and I sold through that. I went to different trade shows um, and set up accounts kind of all over the US. Um, but again, it was that wearing that ha hat as a manufacturer and a distributor. I was so unhappy in it, and it's not what I want to do. I want to let the people that know how to manufacture, manufacture, and uh, distribute to their, their customers that they already have. Is that it? OK, thank you. Fabulous. OK, next we have, um, Ma is it Matej? Matej? How do you? Matej with uh, 600 square. Oh, wait, no, that's not for you. Use that. Is it working out? Is it working out? <laughs> yeah, it's working. On the bench. Hello. 
can I start? Yeah. So hi, my name is Matei. I'm a co-founder of 600 Square, uh, alongside with Harry and James. He's not here today. Um, we design and manufacture uh, functional furniture for small living spaces and people who move often. But let me illustrate. Uh, with every condo building rising, the living spaces are getting smaller. Um, that means that in 2005, the average condo size was 925 square meters. Today, it's between 600 and 700 square feet. Um, square feet, sorry. Uh, square feet. Um, furthermore, uh, almost 60% of people living in cities move every two years in search for better rents and better job opportunities. That means that the millennials and others have to learn how to live in smaller spaces, how to make them functional, and most importantly, how to make them feel like home. Furniture plays a really important role in all of this, and this is where we come in. We, man, and, and this is we come in, and this is why we design the furniture that we design, and that we are pitching here today. We're basically looking to get an investment of twenty thousand dollars to push forward our business. Um, our design is informed by the research we did into living spaces and how people use furniture in smaller in urban centers. We design cable management solutions. We design furniture that has multiple functions and offer extra storage. Um, <laughs> uh, extra storage. Um, we are uh, Harry, Matei, and uh, and James. We work in manufacturing, design, and marketing, and we currently manufacture in Vancouver. And we and we expand. We plan to manufacture in Europe and smaller parts and cheaper parts of Canada and U.S. Uh, we tested the market with a pre-sales um, campaign that was successful, and uh, we are now looking for investors and retailers. So thank you. Well, I totally botched that one, sorry. <laughs> yep. uh, what are your core products? I, I like your presentation, but the one thing that we didn't really get to hear about much is what do you guys really sell? What are your big sellers, or what do you think will be your big sellers? Uh, so right now we have uh, three products. So the shelf, uh, a stool that can be a nightstand, and a tea table. Basically, we are up and running for three months. We happened because of IDS, because of the prototype. We decided to do something, and then we, we are developing from there. Um, so the shelf, um, it's basically you can assemble it in one minute. and has no screws, no hardware, no tools uh, needed. Uh, it, and it fits around 75 books on it, if you use it for books. Um, the tea table has like extra. Uh, extra storage beneath it, if you see with elastics. It has a uh, uh, cable management solution, so when you're watching Netflix on your couch and then your computer is dying, you want your cable to be uh, close by and stuck underneath as well. Uh, and all the furniture come apart with like just a few screws and gets flat packed, uh, and that means easy handling and cheaper uh, shipping costs. Yeah. Um, so we already... Um we started first off started with testing the market. So we interviewed um, and researched 500 participants on um, demographics, income level, what furniture they use the most, and how often they move. So we found that uh, people move every two years, and we wanted to kind of corner that niche and design for that market as affordability and space issues arise. People are going to kind of need this. Um, we're looking for furniture that they could take with them or be multifunctional in that way. So these would be able to compete with, you know, a college kid going out to school that's going to buy a mom dresser or a desk from IKEA and they mm -hmm. can do this instead that's easy set up. Yeah. They can take with them and, and so it's cost comparable or how does that look? Uh, cost comparable. So what we need, the reason why right now we need investment is to, to purchase a bulk product to kind of uh, expand our margins in there to produce. Uh, we spend a lot of time on pricing right now, um, trying to keep it affordable while kind of making, um, doing CNC time, machining time at that point. Um, so all of our products are like, it's super scalable because we use plywood as main material and the more you buy it, the cheaper it is. So it allows bigger uh, uh, margins for us and for the retailers. So all of our prices have margins for retailers as well right now. Uh, so we're just looking to, to to get an investment to buy enough stock, uh, enough bulk material to build a stock and go from there. Hey guys, so 
Uh, I know the buyers at DWR, for example, wouldn't look at your collection without there being a chair component. Um, you know, without a chair, it's just some side tables, right? So, like, if it, I could see you getting, you wanting an investment for like to get your prices down, but without like a first few POs and a complete collection, I'm not sure that would be an awesome spend of 20 grand, just my opinion. Um, but do you have plans for a chair or uh, a bed? Cause that's kind of like a chair, a coffee table and a bed is sort of what I know our buyers look for. Yeah, we have a we have a designs for chair. We just didn't get there to manufacture yet, as well for an office desk. Uh, we're also um, designing a co-working shared desk, uh, uh, but we are not there with beds yet. Yeah. Uh, what what was the first campaign that you guys ran that you were mentioning? So basically, we we created the first coffee table to apply to the prototype at IDS, and then we just put on the website and emailed friends and said, like, we are doing this. If you can help us raise the money to get to IDS, to cover the cost. And from there, we got like 15 sales in basically just a few emails. OK. Aside from that, are you guys doing anything to promote this right now? No. <laughs> OK. Like, we are here. We're doing like social media, but not more than that. Yeah. I'm just wondering. Uh, obviously, the, the the standard questions would be like, is it does it come in any other colors? Is it easily manufacturable in other colors? What are uh, from a, a sales standpoint? Are you breaking it down into individual items? Is it sold as a full collection? Uh, you know, we talk about potentially replacing IKEA style furniture for young people that move a lot. Is it actually price parity to something like that? What what is it actual cost for a table or a chair or a, a table? So we are like slightly above IKEA, uh, because it's, you don't compete with IKEA, right? So like the tea table is 300 Canadian dollars. Uh, the shelf is 150, I think. Um, everything is super scalable. Uh, we'll offer different ranges of colors in laminates that we'll put on the tops, or top of plywood and like different bungee colors and, and straps. Moving on to um, the last, the last pitch we'll be hearing today. Um, Christine Matthews and Will Zhao from um, Evo Eco Smart Bins. Okay, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit today about something that nobody wants to talk about, which is trash. It's depressing, we all generate trash every day, we don't wanna think about it, and it's really ugly. Um, you see it everywhere, and it's not only ugly, but it's also confusing. So we've all been confronted with this, we feel like we need to take an IQ test in order to get the right trash in the right bins. And so uh, we came up with uh, a prototype solution for this on the University of Washington campus um, called Smart Bins. And so these bins are connected with screens. So uh, each screen um, shows you very directly which kind of trash goes in landfill, goes in recycling, and goes in compost. And there's a little scale built into the bottom of each bin so that every time somebody puts something in a bin, they get this immediate um, positive feedback and we even made trash look pretty. Um, so uh, this prototype was really successful at the University of Washington because also statistically, we get it wrong half the time when we're confronted with those different um, infographics. So we improved um, the scenario at the University of Washington and now Evo Eco is translating this idea into a product that can be used by any business anywhere. So we've uh, developed the initial system into a commercial product. It is a now self-enclosed portable smart bin. Um, we redesigned the software for predictive analytics, robust software collection, computer vision, uh, remote updating, but uh, 
This allows for different building operators to see what is and what isn't recyclable or compostable, what's going on with their waste streams in real time. Uh, our partners and clients really love the bins. Uh, they help educate their consumers, employees, visitors on sustainability and waste. I think right now we're in a position where we're looking to seek investment for other brands or players who are interested in helping us move forward and expand. Thanks. Thank you. We'll move on to the judges. On that last um, slide there, are those your current partners and clients, or do you have any paying clients yet, yep. or is it just so testing? So we're in pre-orders right now, and we have, we're generating about 40K in revenue, and we have about 50,000 uh, in revenue and POs pushed out, but 40K per month in the bank coming in. And what's your profit margin like on your So 70% margin on the bins, and then in year two, we will be running a software as a service. Very good. How are you guys reaching those clients that you've already gotten so far? Yeah, so we have a lot of great channel partners, uh, food service, architects, uh, interior designers, um, custodial facility services. There are a lot of outsourced brands that ask, act as channel partners for us. How do you reach them now? So we trade show, we're partnered with actually a couple of them. We just reached out and they're interested in innovation and being behind the brand. I actually think one of the exciting things is the smart bins are very symbolic to a lot of these places because it's more representative of, hey, there's this legislative push towards zero waste going throughout all of North America and all these brands want to help support empowering consumers. With the, uh, I have a question, how did you come up with the name? <laughs> and uh, how tied are you to it? And I'm just curious. Um, it used to be called Money in the Trash um, because there was so much money in doing the research, like in the campus environment, um, a university or any organization can save a ton of money by doing this because there are so many mistakes in the way that people deposit their trash. It costs the organization a lot of money. So we called it Money in the Trash, but then um, with the technology now, it's more of a smart technology that's allowing like smart choices both for the company and the consumer. I'd say, I don't know, as far as like how set on the name, um, we went around a lot of different name iterations. It's, uh, but Smart Bins is what it is at the moment. So at what point, I, I always find it ironic when I see things like this because there's a lot of like bad stuff in the making of television screens and stuff like that. And then we're like recycling, right? That seems like ironic always to me. Yeah. So at what point is there like carbon neutrality in this? Because I mean, you're plugging something in, that's wasting energy, right? So like, I'd like to know that. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So believe it or not, actually recycling even four aluminum cans supports the entire amount of energy that's used to supply the system. Really, you're running a monitor that goes to sleep for 12 hours when the facility's off, and it's just a little microcomputer that sends signals throughout. Uh, it sounds like you guys are already profitable. So <laughs> if you were to raise, I know yeah. that's, that's pretty amazing. If you guys were to raise money right now, how much would you be looking for and what would the proceeds go toward? Yeah, so we're looking for a series seed preferred probably, maybe about one mil to two, uh, mostly for engineering. We, have, we actually have cameras on all of these bins that uh, do computer vision as consumers come up and with their waste. Eventually, we'll have a database of items that can say, oh, hey, is that a Starbucks cup in your hand? That belongs in landfill or recycling. So we're a pretty lean team, mostly design and engineering focused. Um, and that's probably where we'd continue to put resources in. Are the screens interactive in any which way? Like, do, and uh, is there sound associated as well? We, um, we went around the houses on that. They're not interactive at the moment. And you can see the younger the audience, the more they're reaching out and trying to touch and swipe the screens. And so we're looking at that technology as well, like whether they're actually interactive screens. At the moment, no. They're, uh, it's, um, it triggers a change when trash is deposited, but it's not, it's not a touch screen. And there's no sound because typically there's in environments where that might be more distracting than anything else. Not to say it couldn't have sound. And I would add, um, there's no touch screen functionality, but there is a gamified experience when someone comes in, the bins talk back to you with a custom message. And this might be something a brand has specifically. So we believe in this idea of dynamic content. When you're showing different things, the product doesn't lose its novelty, and you get new messages all the time. What marketing tools are you guys using to promote this right now? So right now we're in the pre-order stage. Really what we're doing is working with all our clients. We believe in growth stabilization. So after we do our launches with some of our partners, um, 
we'll leverage their PR side as well and figure out how we can communicate that story properly because waste is actually a very ish large issue in Canada and the US. So mainly you're marketing through your partners right yep. now? Correct. Sorry, who are those partners again? And are they big in the industry? Or? Yeah, so you might have heard of some called Compass USA, um, ABM, Able Services. Uh, all of these guys will do like Microsoft Campus or a lot of these other large brands. Um, Kilroy Properties. So there's quite a few that we'll be pushing forward through as uh, we grow in the market. And uh, we will have you come off stage. And thank you for all the Pitch Tank participants. There's a lot of really great ideas here where you can hopefully see why we were so excited by what we uh, got in our submission. So you have the, um, the ballots. You guys please fill that out and then pass them down the row. We'll pick them up for you. And the judges, if we can turn the judges' mics off, we're going to just have a little huddle here and deliberate. Um, and we'll be back with you guys to announce the audience favorite and the judges voting um, in just a few minutes. Okay. I overheard the judges' deliberation. I know it was not an easy choice. Um, so, and we have an audience favorite, and we have the judges, and they are different. So, I'm going to let the judges first kind of describe, uh, tell, tell, announce who the winner is, and give a little background behind their their thinking process. Um, first of all. Uh, thank you to everybody who uh, pitched. Uh, this was actually really, really strong this year. Uh, there were a lot of really interesting products. Um, our deliberation and our decision is uh, we are going. The winner of Pitch Tank is Ava Byte. Why don't you guys go up? And. Uh, there is, we see that uh, there's a lot of really interesting things within this company, within this brand. It's exceptionally on trend with where food growing is going in homes. Uh, it's super practical for gift giving, and it's really design aesthetic and forward. And uh, congratulations. We're really, really impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and oh, does anyone want, do you want, do you want to say anything else? OK. And the, um, Audience winner is um, Evo Eco. Woohoo! <laughs> okay, you want to say anything? You can say something about some of your thinking there. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I liked Evo Eco, but I liked your guys' brand too. <laughs> um, but I think one of the things that uh, held Evo Eco back was I think that some yeah, of us felt like maybe the name wasn't. So, so awesome. Here, come over here. Like, we just thought, wouldn't it be sick if it was called something like, uh, I don't know, Trash Here or something like that, you know, <laughs> something. Uh, we, we didn't even brainstorm design, so that's just mine. If that, I'll talk to you about money later if you use it. Um, but uh, we really liked uh, the plant thing, I think, at the end of the day, because of also its design aesthetic, and um, just thought it'd be a lot of fun to have. So. Yeah, and you guys will follow up later about setting up some sort of meeting, mentorship over here. Um, but uh, thank you guys so much. Thanks for part all the participants. Lots of great ideas. Thank you, audience. Come back tomorrow. We've got great programming on stage again. Thank you.